Gomorrah kings were. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. Yeah. Uh, not a place to fall down, is it, in a slime pit, eh? And, um, and they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom. Now you'll notice that he'd set his tent towards Sodom when, they, um, when these kings attacked, he was dwelling there. And they took him uh, and, all, and his goods and departed. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eschol and brother of Ana. And these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And Hobah means in the Hebrew lurking place. And uh, these people uh, went, and the amazing thing is, Abram's told that Lot has been taken captive. Now, Lot, you remember, had chosen the watered plain of Jordan. He'd separated from Abram because of a contention with the herdsmen. Now, there was no reason why Abram should put himself out to go and help him, but he does. And he goes and he pursues these kings and he gets hold of them and he slays them. And he brought him back. He brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. Now Abram went out and he set these people free and he set all their goods free. Now the amazing thing is that power ministry will accomplish that in other words here you have a picture of Abram moving in the charismatic ministry if you want to call it that um, those that know the terminology what it means is moving in giftings in the angelic ministry Abram went and he set his brother Lot free he released him from his bondages he released all his goods again and he set him into a place of freedom where he had freedom to make a choice now many many people get that opportunity they get taken captive by the enemy that's the devil the world they yield themselves and God will send a man with power and authority who can bring freedom to them in the name of Jesus Christ a man who knows how to pray and get hold of God. I've seen people who have been bound and crippled by things like arthritis, totally healed by God. Now, a man has authority in Christ to command the things to go and they'll go. You can command the devourer to get off people and leave them alone and for a time they'll go. Because if you have authority in Jesus' name and you're a true son of God, then you have authority to do these things if you are a light, not just a son of light. And if you have that authority, you can do these things. But when you do it, you know one thing, that a lot of people will take their freedom, but only for a short while. They won't live in it. Though you bring them to Christ and you present Christ to them and you present the cross to them and you bring deliverance to their lives through the power of the cross, they aren't prepared to yield their hearts and lives to live under the power of it. They want to go their own way. And that is the tragedy with power ministry. You can build a big church with power ministry. All you have to do is stick a sign on the outside and say, 
come here and you'll get healed and delivered and you know we'll cast the devils out and we can do those things but the problem is that what you get is a lot of people who come to God for the goodies but aren't coming to Christ to set their hearts to love and worship him and so you'll have to keep ministering to them keep bringing deliverance keep casting out devils keep uh, uh, praying for the sick uh, and you'll find it's a continuous thing and you'll get a church full of problems now those people don't really want God what they want is the benefits they don't want to give anything they come to get and you'll find churches are full of people who, who um, denominational churches especially are full of people who basically are either Sunday Christians and do it because they feel they ought to which is total hypocrisy or they're full of people who go to get something you know they want a bit of companionship or friendship because they feel lonely they don't go there to give to God they go there to get and that is a wrong spirit now Lot had got taken captive and Abram went and set him free and Christ commands us to let the captives go so when people do come abound we let them go but we don't go to where they are we wait till they come but knowing that most of them that you bring deliverance to and present Christ to won't want him but they might want the benefits that he brings I've seen people healed I know people in this town who've been healed by the power of God and you'll meet them in the street and they say well I've no need now I'm healed I'm okay Christ met me I'll always believe in God thank you very much goodbye <laughs> you know isn't that presumptuous eh but there are people like that who just go after God for what they can get and then they say well thanks God you know mighty kind of you now I'll go and live my own life that of course will take them to hell and damnation and their condemnation will be ten times worse than if they never knew that's the awful thing about it it says in the scriptures that um, if, a, if a person an evil spirit goes out of a person and um, that person is cleaned up and made wholesome that spirit will go wandering in dry places and then after a time it'll say to seven other spirits come on let's go back to that house that was cleaned up that house I used to possess and it says the latter end of that man is worse the latter state than the former and you often see that people who go away from God slide very quick they go down very rapidly the reason is they don't want to pay the price and um, Lot was set free now it speaks of Abram having the power ministry not Lot and the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shava which is the king's dale and Shava is a level place and Melchizedek king of Salem brought forth bread and wine and he was the priest of the most high God and he blessed him and said blessed be Abraham of the most high God possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be the most high God which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand now Melchizedek um, speaks of the priest of the most high God and many people wonder who Melchizedek was now if you go back into uh, the Judaic history and you find that um, in the second century BC there were many many um, scrolls written about who this Melchizedek was and you will find that the Jewish people have one idea and then you find that Paul writes in the scriptures and mentions in the book of Hebrews Melchizedek and uh, then you'll find that about 400 AD they um, began to get a lot of 
doctrinal things out of Melchizedek. Uh, my own opinion is no one knows. <laughs> uh, he was without father, without mother. I believe that he was after the order of the priesthood of Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek in the um, uh, Hebrew means my king is righteousness. Well, I know who my king is, Jesus Christ. And I know who's righteous, Jesus Christ. And if you want my opinion, it was Jesus Christ. I cannot think that anyone else would have broken bread and taken wine but Christ. But you can believe what you want to believe. It doesn't say definitely one way or the other. Uh, there, it's clear there was no genealogy for him, but he was a king and he brought forth the bread and the wine and he was the priest. Not a priest, but the priest of the Most High God. And of course, our High Priest who stands before God is Jesus Christ, after the order of Melchizedek, so it says in the book of Hebrews. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God. Now, this king gives Abram an understanding of who God is that he hasn't had up to this time. God had said to Abram, you go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land that I'll show you. Now when Melchizedek meets him, he says to him, look, um, blessed be Abraham of the Most High God. This High God is the possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God which have delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And Abram gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to, to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Now you'll notice that Abram was blessed by the Most High God, the uh, possessor of heaven and earth. And now Abram quotes to the uh, king of Sodom, Look, I've lifted up my hand to the Most High God. And he uses the same name in the Hebrew, the possessor of heaven and earth. In other words, Abram had a revelation of who God was at this point. He knew the God that had called him out was the heaven, the, the possessor of heaven and earth, the Most High God. And he came to an understanding of it. And therefore he says, I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Ana, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. In other words, Abram was saying, look, I understand that this God is the possessor of heaven and earth. I have lifted up my hand to be a follower of him. Now, king of Sodom, you that's taken my nephew into such sin, I won't take anything from you in case you turn around and say you've blessed me. The possessor of heaven and earth's God, I'll only receive from him. I don't want anything from you. God gave these enemies into my hand. I don't want the spoils of war and the bounty of war. You take it. And so he turns it aside and he won't take anything. Now th at this point I want to say something and that is that many times you'll find healing ministries or deliverance ministries or ministries um, spend most of their time trying to get things. Um, if you go to America, one of the biggest things they do is a healing ministry will turn up at a church and you'll get four or five thousand people in the churches and uh, they will spend uh, 40 minutes or 30 minutes preaching and then they'll pray for the sick and God will meet them and then they'll spend 45 minutes taking a collection and boy do they lay it on now when we bring freedom for people the last thing we want to do is bleed them let them keep their stuff 
One thing I always do when I'm in America is I avoid having love offerings. Uh, I won't do it. I don't like it, and I don't want it done. I don't like the idea of of a man, you know, getting up there preaching, and then bringing freedom and deliverance and healing to people, and then trying to suck them dry. Different if it's your church. They have a duty to support the ministry. But if you're going visiting somewhere else, it's a dangerous thing. And Abram said, look, I bought deliverance, but you keep your goods. Okay, I might deserve them, but you keep them. The person who looks after me is God. Something we all want to remember. Don't be kind of uh, pushed in to receiving something. As I say, it's different if it's your church. Because... um, says in the scriptures that you shouldn't muzzle the ox that treads the corn uh, and that that's a different principle but I'm talking about where there's ministries where you go and visit okay you go you bless them and leave them blessed you know don't want anything um, and I've always tried to keep that principle in fact in some places I've been to they've given me money and I've given it back to them partly because I didn't want them to have any share in my ministry uh, because of what they were. Um, felt they were better off keeping their own money and spending it on themselves. And Abram felt that about the king of Sodom. He didn't want any part of unrighteousness. And we have to be careful who we receive from. And so he, he said, I'm not having any of it. After these things... The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now I want you to notice that Melchizedek introduced God as the possessor of heaven and earth. Now God comes and says, Don't fear, I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward. In other words, he's getting a progressive revelation of who God is. And you'll find in the Hebrew, the names are different. Um, They talk about Yahweh and Jehovah, and you'll find that um, the names, there's seven names, because seven is the number of completion or perfection. There's seven names for God, and here we find it's the uh, God, the shield, and the exceeding great reward. And Abram said, and here comes the amazing thing, once Abram finds that, God is his shield. God is his exceeding great reward. He immediately says, Lord God, what will thou give me? Seeing I go childless. Listen, God, I've turned down things from other people. I won't let them support me. But what will you give me? If you're my reward, what are you going to give me? Seeing I go childless. And the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. Hello, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Now it's interesting here that there's a progressive revelation. And in scriptures you always find things are progressive. And if you look down in verse, uh, uh, where are we? Uh, Verse 5, he brought him forth abroad, God did, and he said, look now toward heaven. Now I want you to just keep your finger there and flick back to verse um, chapter 13. And when uh, um, verse 14, um, chapter 13, verse 14, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. 
Arise, walk through the land in the length of it. Now, in chapter 13, God tells him of his earthly heritage. In other words, he was going to bring forth the tribe of Israel. The Hebrews were going to come out of Abraham naturally. Now, that was the natural seed. All right? And he'd come to that point where he could understand he was going to have a natural seed. Then God takes him on. He tells him his, his, his shield, an exceeding great reward, is the possessor of heaven and earth. He knows about his earthly um, inheritance because his seed is going to possess this land. He realizes that he's going to produce a race. And he doesn't know what they're going to be called, but they're the Hebrews. And they're going to be produced and they're going to inhabit that land. The Jews are going to possess the land. That's what he's told. But then God takes him out and he says, now look toward heaven. Jesus had said to him, you're, you know, you're, the, you're of the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. He knew about earthly things. Now God was going to tell him about the heavenly he said, okay, you looked, you saw the land, your seed is going to be as the dust of the earth, but now look towards the heaven, your seed's going to be as the stars in the heaven. But he wasn't talking about the Jews any longer, he was talking about those who should come to faith. Those who come to, in the same way as Abraham to righteousness, for he goes on. And he says, so shall I seed be, and verse 6 of chapter 15, and he believed in the Lord, and at that moment it says, God counted it to him for righteousness. All right? God, at that moment, and this is the first time that we read in the Scriptures that Abraham was righteous. God counted it to him for righteousness. In other words, he was justified at this point. He had faith in the heavenly realm at this point. Now he had the revelation of the cross because the bread and the wine had been bought out by Melchizedek. He had the revelation of not taking anything from the world because he denied the king of Sodom and wouldn't take any of his gifts. He had the revelation of um, God being his shield and his exceeding great reward and therefore he knew that his inheritance had to come from God. Now the inheritance that came for God from God wasn't going to be the Jews, it was going to be looking up to heaven. It was going to be a heavenly people, a totally different people. And at that point, God says, look, and he counts his faith in believing that as righteousness. At that point, Abram becomes righteous. Now the seed, of course, speaks of a different seed. Now if you keep your finger there and turn with me to Romans chapter 4, Page 218 in the New Testament. If you've got a Cambridge. Okay, and um, in Romans chapter 4, and where are we? Let's see. Uh, okay, and in verse 20. And he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was also able to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was written, not for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him, but who for? Who? Who? us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification amen now the story of Abram was written for who us that it, it, it righteousness was imputed to him that was written for us. It applies for us. 
Now the righteousness came when he believed in the heavenly realm. He was looking up to heaven at this time, even before he looked at the sand and the land. Now he's looking to heaven and seeing all the stars in the firmament that no man can number. Even if they send their little rockets up into space with their electronic peep machines, they'll never number them, thank God. The only black holes they've got's in their head between their ears. Um, stupid men. You can't number them, God says, so don't try. People like to do things, you know, when God says you can't, man always gets so inflated he tries. God says you can't number them. And so Abram saw that he was going to have an inheritance. Now God had shown him twice two inheritances. There was the natural and there's the heavenly. And that's why we are Abraham's children. Because we have been born of faith. Righteousness is imputed to us who believe on Jesus Christ. But Christ came through Abram's seed. He was one of Abram's children. He was a Hebrew. And therefore, all the nations of the world are now blessed by righteous Abraham as God promised. For we who believe in Christ are blessed and we're brought into a relationship with God and righteousness is imputed to us through the faith of Abraham. That's what's so wonderful. We're not born from the earth. We're born from heaven. It says so in the scriptures. We've got to be born from above by the Spirit of God. Now, of course, we had a natural birth, but I wasn't born a Jew. Now, some of you might have been. I wasn't. Um, I was born of um, Gentile parenthood. But to come into Christ, I need, whether I'm Jew or Gentile, I need to be born from above by the Spirit of God. I need the Spirit of God to bring a birth and a change about in my life that gives me the nature and life of Christ. I need to have Jesus Christ dwelling in my heart by faith now. Abram had faith in God, but his faith and his righteousness was imputed on a different basis. He believed God's promise. I believe God's promise. Christ and the Holy Ghost. And him indwelling us. Amen? And I believe in that way that brings righteousness. That is a right relationship with God. And um, then he says, And he said unto him, this is God, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Now you remember we went back into Acts of the Apostles and we saw that Abram had the call of God right at the beginning, didn't he, in Ur of Chaldees, and he had to wait till Terah, his father, had died, and he dwelled in Haran, or Charan, in the, it says in Acts, um, until the time of his father's death, and then he moved out on God's word again. Do you remember that? We went through that. And Terah meant delay, didn't it? It delayed what God desired. And now he's come out, and God says, look, Melchizedek has identified the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. God has said, I'm their exceeding great uh, shield and exceeding great reward. And then he's talked to him, and he then says to him, I'm the Lord that brought you out of Ur of Chaldees. In other words, I began the call in your life. So he identifies himself so clearly, Abram knows it's the same God. Same person. And um, to give thee this land to inherit it. Amen. And Abram said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Now, dear old Abram was no mug. When God promised something, he said, Okay, God, if you really mean it, prove it now lots of people don't like that idea but I believe in the idea if God says something you can always test out whether it's true or not okay Lord if you really mean it how am I going to know if this is really 
if I'm really going to inherit this, I need a sign to know. I want to know it in reality. Now God doesn't get angry or upset when we say that to him. He's delighted. Now this is when God has spoken and told you something. Then, uh, I mean, don't just go and try and prove God when he hadn't said anything to you. What you'll prove is you're a nitwit. Um, don't try that. But when God, I'm talking about when God speaks, not when you get some cuckoo idea in the middle of your brain and you think it's God talking, but when God reveals himself to you and really speaks to you as he does um, to those who truly know him, then you can turn around to God and say, all right, that's your promise, but how do I know it is? How do I know I'm going to inherit this thing? I need confirmation of that. Now, don't forget, he's already believed God and it's been imputed to him for righteousness. That's the amazing thing. But even though he's believed God, he says, I want a bit of confirmation here. And God very patiently says, and, the, um, and he said unto him, Take me, an heifer of three years old, now immediately he's talking and he's explaining that he's going to be the provider of the true sacrifice. Take me. An heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And you'll remember when you come to the Mosaic Tabernacle which is the picture of the heavenly realm which is important for everyone to study um, you will find those are the sacrifices that represent Jesus Christ and were full, fulfilled in Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. God himself was taking the price of sin. And he took, these, um, took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another. But the birds he divided not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now the picture of this is the picture... You remember what the fowls of the air are? What are they? Hmm? Demons and devils uh, in the New Testament. And um, Jesus talks about the seed falling and the fowls of the air coming and plucking it up. You remember? Okay, the fowls of the air come and Abraham protects it there. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. At this point, you remember another deep sleep fell on someone. Uh, that was on uh, Adam and Eve was created. You remember in the garden. Another deep sleep falls on someone. In the New Testament, that's on Christ. He was three days and three nights in the ground and he rose from the dead. Third day he rose again from the dead. Uh, and a, the darkness, you remember, came when great darkness came over the whole earth when Christ was crucified. Do you remember for the space of three hours from the sixth to the ninth hour? Darkness was upon the face of the whole earth. And then for um, the third day he rose again from the dead. Now Abram goes through that experience of the horror of death and resurrection. In the sacrifice it's fulfilled in type. He doesn't actually die but he experiences what death is at this point. And um, he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And here's the wonderful thing. We get the prophecy of what happens to the children in Egypt under Pharaoh. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Now old age is good. God says so. So don't despise it. He said you'll be buried in a good old age. See Jackie. Glory to God. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Now, I want you to note the two things that passed between the pieces. Was a smoking lamp 
and a burning furnace. Now I want you to notice what went in front of the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. A pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. And so that's how they knew it was the God that appeared to Abraham because the symbol of God was the same. God appears in the pillar of cloud and in the pillar of fire. And so Abram sees this. And um, in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Amen. God made a covenant. Now the covenant was the God of the smoking and the God of the fire. The God of the cloud and the God of the fire. And you remember that he, Jesus is taken up to heaven on what? And when the Holy Ghost comes down, what appears above all of them? Fire. And always where God's operating, he will always give those two signs. The cloud and the fire. And you remember that the children of Israel, it says, were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. Do you remember when they came out? It says so in Hebrews. Um, when they walk through the Dead Sea. And always those are the symbol of God. Amen. And it expresses to us and shows us. But here we see an interesting thing. For in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. Now if you keep your finger there and go back to chapter 13 and verse 15. God says, For all the land which thou seest, what? To thee will I give it. Now, when, do you follow that? In chapter 13, verse 15, says, I'll give you the land. Here he says, I have given it to you. In the chapter 15, it um, turns around in verse 18 and says, Unto thy seed have I given this land. In other words, when the covenant was established, even though it took time to outwork, it was already fulfilled in God. That was given. When Abram believed God, and it was imputed to him for righteousness, at that point, all those things that God had promised, he was the possessor of at that point. In the heavenly realm it was done. In the natural it had to be outworked. But the reality of it was it was done already. I've given it to your seed. But the seed hadn't been born. The 400 years hadn't gone through. God hadn't delivered them from Egypt. No he hadn't. But it already was theirs. That's the wonderful thing. When God promises something and when he establishes the covenant the reality of it is it's already yours. But you've got to get there. And there's a distance to travel between where you are and what is your true possession. In God's eyes it's yours already. You have to walk the walk of faith. You are the bride of Christ. You've been born of God's Spirit. The trouble is you've been totally delivered. You're a new creation. You're seated in Christ in heavenly places. The trouble is you live down here. You've got to walk up there. And the way of holiness and the road of holiness and a walk with God takes time. And God deals with your life and changes you and delivers you. Now even though it's already yours, you've got to learn how to possess it. It says possess your souls in peace. You purify your soul in obeying the truth. Now the fact is, it's already given you. But having been given you, you've got to take it. There are enemies there. The children of Israel were told the promised land was theirs. Abram was told it was, it was given to his seed. Yet when the children of Israel came along, there was the Amorite, the uh, Perizzite, the Canaanite, the um, Jebusite. They were in the land. What have they got to do? They've got to go in and drive the enemies out. Slaughter them. Glory to God. Get rid of them. 
But it doesn't mean because there are enemies there that you haven't got the reality of it. It just means you've got a little bit of warfare. That's all. It'll soon be over. And when the battle's over, it says, we shall wear a crown. And what we don't like is a bit of a fight. We're, we've been educated to be pacifists. But there's got to be a battle with inside. You've got to learn how to live in Christ and how to walk in Christ. And possess your soul and get your mind delivered from the things that would um, come against you. Those are necessities in your life. Wonderful things, wonderful opportunities to develop. So that when you get to glory, you'll know how to live in it. You'll know how to fight the enemy of the Lord. Because you've been trained down here. And this is just a training camp. You know, it's only uh, kind of a, a, a school of qualification, really. You're just learning how to live in heaven. Now, you might not see it that way, but that's what God's doing. And I dare say you'll, there'll be dealings when you get the other side of the grave as well. And I'm sure there will. Until you take your rightful place in this new city that's been prepared. It's a wonderful place in the heavenly realm. And we want to go there, don't we? Now it's already ours. God's already got your place prepared. Jesus said... I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, he says, I'll come again and receive you to myself. Now, Jesus has already prepared the place for us. It's all waiting for us. It's ours. He's put our name plate on it. Our name's in that book of life, in glory. Now, all I've got to do is get there. But the problem is, I have to keep living till I step out of this body. And when I step out of this body, I just go straight home. But whilst I'm living, I've got to be prepared so that when I get there, I'll be happy living there. I mean, supposing I wanted, you know, all the baubles of sin and all the kind of trappings of the world. I'd be miserable in heaven. Supposing I wanted to live in filth and lust and perversions. I wouldn't want to go to heaven. It wouldn't be the place to be. Because it's holiness and light and purity and cleanness and praise and love. So I'm, I'm graduating to that. God's dealing with me, changing me. So that when I get there, I'll be happy. Now, believe me, you won't spend all your time in heaven playing a harp. You know, and sitting on a golden cloud, going twang, twang, you know, uh, like Nero, um, while Rome burnt. You, you, I mean, that's not, you, you'll have, there'll be cities to rule. And, you know, the saints of God are going to judge the angels. There's going to be cities to rule. There's a life there. There's all sorts of things in the heavenly realm. You don't have any understanding of. There's um, places where uh, you can worship. There's great parks, massive places where you can go and eat the fruit of the trees. And the trees are living. And the fruit is heavenly. There are angelic beings that you'll have responsibility for. And God will set you to work. You're not going there to put your feet up forever, twinking a harp on a cloud. That's just not what it's like. It's not like that at all. And the wonderful thing is that God is preparing us so that we're equipped to live that life when we get there. And we'll be ready. Now there'll be no sickness there, there'll be no deformity, there'll be no, um, no sin, nothing that defiles there. It'll all be clean and pure and bright. It's pristine glory. But the wonderful thing about it all is we can come into the presence of the king. And there's all different levels in heaven. There's places where you can, um, depending on how you go on with God and how obedient you are, you'll find there's, you, there's places where you can come into the presence of the king. God's there in every area of heaven, but there are different realms. That's why people have different degrees of light. And you'll find there are different realms 
uh, of thrones, there's different realms uh, of people, there's different understandings and different relationships with God. Some people are like the disciples who, there were three, you remember, who went up the mountaintop and saw the Lord transfigured. But there were twelve who were called out of the multitudes. And then there were some three hundred who just followed the Lord afar off. Each one had a relationship with Christ, but their relationship was so different. And in the heavenly realm, you'll find there's places around the throne. There's the four and twenty elders, there's the four beasts. And then there's a multitude that no man can number on the sea of glass. And there's different uh, relationships with Christ. Different things to enter into. And when you get into that realm, you realize that there's um, great potential. Now each of you can go right to the highest point. But God already knows how far you're going to get. That's why he's prepared a place for you. But you don't know how far you're going to get. That's the problem. So you've got to press forward to the prize for the mark of the high... Uh, <laughs> press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. In other words, you just don't know the place that God's prepared for you. But believe me, it's going to take every ounce of your being to get you there. That's the wonderful thing about it. God demands everything. He doesn't ask for it and he doesn't request it. You have to give everything to Jesus Christ. He will be Lord of everything. That's it. Now there's no right of appeal and there's no opportunity for negotiation. It's the end of it. God has set the terms. You either take it or leave it. And if you leave it, you go to hell. So you have to go God's way, unless you're a madman or a lunatic. Then you better go away somewhere else. You've got to go all the way. Amen? Press right through. And don't worry, God loves you enough to make sure you get to the place that he's prepared. He'll do everything to make sure you get there. My, he'll... If you get into some Sodom, he's going to turn around and send kings to take you captive and then he'll send a man who's got the uh, authority to deliver you. Now you can choose Lot. We're going to go on and read a little later on. Lot's left the story at the moment, but we're coming back to it. Lot goes back to Sodom, having been told by God. Look, Lot was given a warning. God caused him to be captured and taken captive and all his goods to be taken away. Now, don't you think he was trying to tell Lot something? Lot, this isn't a safe place to live. What does Lot do? He goes back there after Abram's delivered him and becomes a judge. Lots of people do that. Once they've had deliverance, they go back into the world and get a greater place than they had before. That's the snare of the world. But God gives you opportunity. And if you're a child of light, then believe me, God will make sure that you'll never go back. He'll make it so uncomfortable. If you try and go and live in Egypt, he'll get Pharaoh to kick you out. He'll send plagues on them that are going to discomfort them and they'll be saying, get out of here, we don't need you around. You bring us a curse. He'll do everything. Because he loves you so much that he won't let you go wrong. Amen? You say, well, what about free will? Of course you have free will. You can go the easy way or the hard way. That's free will. <laughs> it's true. You can set your heart to go God's way and delight his heart. Or you can let him chasten you until you go his way. Now, whichever way you go... You know, my children, they can choose to do things. When I say, look, do that, they can either do it the easy way, which is they get up and say, yes, Daddy, or they grumble. And they find that a hand descends on their rear end, and there's a few tears, and there's a bit of sorrow, and I say, now do it. Now, whichever way it goes, they're going to do it, because Daddy says they're going to do it. I love them. God loves us. Now choose your way. 
it's far easier to yield to him but if you want a belt on the backside don't worry he'll do it it'll cost you a few tears and when God whacks you one it's more painful when the chastening of God comes it's a little more uh, what I would call complete and firm and when God does it, you learn. Now some people are dumb. God has to chasten them quite a bit. Other people wise up quicker. Don't they? I know my son, he knows me. He knows the tone of my voice. And he knows I say, do something. And, and if um, he doesn't do it immediately, I say, Matthew... And all right, all right, all right. He knows what will happen if he doesn't. You know, and we need to get sensitive to God's voice. He'll say it once, the second time he begins to say, you better get your skates on and get going. Else you're going to learn that God means business. Amen? Now the second time Lot's called out, you remember God sends two angels who drag him out of Sodom. And then he hails fire and brimstone and burns the place. And he escaped by the skin of his teeth. Or by the seat of his pants, whichever way you want to look at it. And he just got out of there in time. But God's faithful. Amen? He's our shield and is our exceeding great reward. Glory to God. He'll shield us from our enemies. The problem is, our shield that he's given us doesn't work when it comes to his dealings. There's no way you can use his shield against him. He'll be our shield, but don't you try and get out of his dealings. You won't. Nothing will protect you. He loves you too much for that. Amen? That's the way it is. And he'll take us on. And with Abram he said, I've given you this land, it's yours. Uh, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Canaanites, the, um, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, and the Kadam, <laughs> Kadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Rephaims, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites and the Jebusites God says I'm going to give it to you it's yours I have given it Amen and if we believe God Jesus has prepared a place for us Amen it's ours it's already there waiting for us it's got our name and I tell you it's got a golden bed inside golden harp and a golden trumpet waiting for you those are just for entertainment Saturday night <laughs> you'll be busy all week don't worry but there's beautiful things to do amen he's faithful and so Abram has the covenant of God established death covenant he realizes there's got to be sacrifice I've got to die to self I've got to die to my desires I've got to allow God to have his way he'll get me there I always think looking around at a church and considering myself God always takes the impossible it's the are nots the people who are too well qualified he doesn't bother with the people who could make it easily God doesn't want he likes something that gives him a challenge so he chose you he likes something that's uh, going to be a real trophy of grace he doesn't want the people that can get there easy he doesn't want the, the uh, polite the nice the made it people the things that are he chooses the things that are not amen and he says, they're going to be my trophies of grace. There's no point in getting someone that's all um, kind of glittery and shiny on the outside and who, who seems 
you know, so suitable. God doesn't want them. That's natural sweetness, which is honey. And he's cursed that. He wants the people that are nothing. He says, those are going to be my people. And what a trophy of grace. And the Lord's sitting in glory now and he's saying, see you angels? See down there? That's a trophy of grace. You never thought I could change his heart. I did. You thought it was impossible that I could ever get hold of her, didn't you? Well, we did, Father. Well, see what I've done? Well, we can see it. And he says, that's my wisdom, you know. It's revealed in the church. That's how you know what I'm really like. And they look in wonder and amazement and think, fancy starting with them. He could have got far better people. He chooses the roughest material. But what a beautiful job he makes of it. And they watch us all through our lives. And when we're ready to step out of our bodies, they're just amazed at the changes that God has brought. The wonderful things he's done. Amen. We're going to sing. You know, there's only one song that fits it. It's wonderful what God has done. Eternal life is in his Son. And by his Holy Spirit free, he's come to live his life in me. Amen. We'll go on with Abraham. There's plenty to go on to. His name hasn't even been changed yet. It's got a long way down to go. It's a beautiful story though. That I could ever get hold of her, didn't you? Well, we did, Father. Well, see what I've done? Well, we can see it. And he says, that's my wisdom, you know. It's revealed in the church. That's how you know what I'm really like. And they look in wonder and amazement and think, fancy starting with them. He could have got far better people. He chooses the roughest material. But what a beautiful job he makes of it. And they watch us all through our lives. And when we're ready to step out of our bodies, they're just amazed at the changes that God has brought. The wonderful things he's done. Amen. We're going to sing. You know, there's only one song that fits it. It's wonderful what God has done. Eternal life is in his Son. And by his Holy Spirit free, he's come to live his life in me. Amen? We'll go on with Abraham. There's plenty to go on to. His name hasn't even been changed yet. It's got a long way down to go. It's a beautiful story though.